Ladies and gentlemen, could the seed oils be the primary cause of the diseases of civilization? Heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, the list goes on and on. And could these so-called heart-healthy vegetable oils actually and ironically be the primary cause of heart disease and the major cause of all these other diseases of civilization as well? Take a look at this uh, front page of an article from Harvard, if you would. Now, dare I have the audacity to question the Harvard School of Public Health? And uh, the nutrition department of Tufts University? And the nutrition department of Mayo Clinic? And the American Heart Association? Yet that is exactly what I will do today, and this is exactly the hypothesis that I will present and defend today because I believe in it. So why would I think this? Paracelsus dictum states that the dose makes the poison, and we're consuming these highly pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic seed oils in massive doses, and consumption has spread all around the world, and the entire world is becoming overweight, obese, and sick. And it's not their fault. My charge to you today is that while processed foods are driving virtually all of this chronic disease, of the processed food components, and there's basically only four, it is the seed oils that are the primary drivers because they are the biological poisons. They are poisons, plain and simple, and today I'll try to show you how and why. So, my financial disclosures first. I'm a book author, I'm a researcher, and I'm the founder and president of Cure AMD Foundation. Um, I accept no compensation for any of these roles, so I, I, I apparently have no financial interests. But that's not really true, though, because we still like to eat. So, anyway, all right. What I will submit to you is that there are really two primary drivers of obesity and chronic disease. Yes, obesity and chronic disease, and it's nutrient deficiency and toxicity. But there's only a single source for this, and it's processed foods. So I know this is not news to you, but this is so fundamentally and critically important, I believe. And if you, if you think about this, if you flip this on its head, Processed foods are the sole driver of nutrient deficiency and toxicity. And we're not paying nearly enough attention, I don't believe, to nutrient deficiency or toxicity, either one. Now, if you look at processed food as a percentage of the American diet, all this in the red, you see, as of 2009, 63 to 74% of the American diet is made up of processed food, and processed food is just four things, vegetable oil, trans fats, sugar, and refined wheat flour, right? All right, and if, if you add in alcohol, that adds another 70%. So what this means is, is <laughs> none of that has virtually any micronutrients, right? You don't get vitamins out of that, and, and it's really mineral deficient as well. So that means you've got 29% of, of your diet left to give you all of your nutrients, right? And we haven't even gotten into the toxicity of the processed foods, and you're gonna have a lot of toxicity with uh, polyunsaturated vegetable oils, trans fats, and at least the fructose component of sugar. All right, now, I went to medical school 1986 to 1990, and I'm gonna give you more history about medicine in the next four or five minutes than what I got in four years of medical school, I promise you. All right? So, because I think this is critically important, and when we look at this and then we correlate it to the diet, it's powerful. Okay, so here's what we usually see, right? The world is getting heavier. The United States leads the way, all right? We're winning this race. And here's where the U.S. Dietary Guidelines were introduced, 1980. All right? And we know total energy intake over the next decade went up about 250 calories a day, right? Everybody's probably seen this. 
And, uh, and then the next thing that often you know, is said is, as you can see, carbs went up, fat went down, carbs are the problem, right? Not so fast. The fat composition here is still changing, and that is gonna be the crux of what I'll try to show you today. Now, this is Joan's paper from 2011, and what it shows is, is that in 1900, the top three causes of death were all infectious disease. It was pneumonia, tuberculosis, GI infections, right? Whereas by 2010, um, seven of the top 10 causes of disease are all chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, stroke, uh, Alzheimer's disease, type two diabetes, all that, right? So let's walk through heart disease over the last 200 years. So from Joan's paper, we know that in Boston, in the town of Boston, in 1811, there were no heart disease deaths listed, all right? There was 25 sudden deaths. Probably most of those were cardiac valvular, all right? In the entire 19th century, there's eight worldwide papers, reports essentially, of heart disease, extraordinarily rare disorder. Um, 1897, Sir William Mosler, famed physician of Johns Hopkins, he re recounts his previous 21 years of hospital history about six cases of angina, never seen an MI, never seen a heart attack. 1900, Jones paper tells us 12.5% of people died of heart-related disease, but it was virtually all cardiac valvular. It was syphilis, endocarditis, rheumatic fever. It wasn't coronary artery disease related, right? 1912, John Herrick publishes the first known case of heart attack in the United States, documented and documented with autopsy evidence. Night, uh, 1930s, though, heart disease becomes the leading cause of death. Virtually unknown 30 years earlier, all right? In fact, when John Herrick published the, the, the paper about the MI, it wasn't even taken seriously for about a decade, all right? Advance forward to 2010, 32% of Americans dying of heart disease, virtually one in three, all right? So the increase looks something like that red line right there. Cancer. Boston, 1811, one in 188 people died of cancer. 1900, it's rising, one in 17 in the US. 2010, 31.1% of people die of cancer, right? That's almost, again, one in three. So the increase looks something like this. And what I hear all the time is, is yeah, but we're getting older. I'm telling you that does not explain this. And let me tell you very quickly, and I've written on this, I've spoken on this. Let me give you two, two quick statistics. In the year 1800, 43.3% of children did not live to see their fifth birthday. In 1900, it wasn't much better. 36.2% of children did not live to see their fifth birthday, and 4% of women died in childbirth. That drops the life expectancy down drastically, and that's why that's so low. So back to cancer here, 62-fold increase in cancer in 200 years, right? How about type 2 diabetes? We know in the 19th century, diabetes of any type was rare and presumably rare for all of history prior. 1935, it's rising, 0.37%. This continues to rise. Uh, and we're at 9.4% by 2015. This is a 25-fold increase in type 2 diabetes in 80 years. How about obesity? 19th century. We know that obesity was 1.2% in men, age 18 to 80, in uh, Texas and, and uh, Nebraska prisons, right? Okay, look at this. By 1960, we're at 13% obesity. That was a tenfold increase already, right, when we thought we were lean. So this continues to rise, and, and by uh, 2015, we're at 39.8% obesity, right? This is a 33-fold increase in obesity in about 115 years, and we are on target to be at 50% of Americans ob obese by 2030. That was published in JAMA just a few weeks ago. Okay, age-related macular degeneration, my area of expertise. 1851 was when this disease was first discoverable. Between 1851 and, and 1930, there was no more than 50 cases of macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65. No more than 50 cases in all the world's literature. Yet, today, this year, 2020, 196 million people affected worldwide, on target to be 288 million 
by 2040. So what this means, back in the 19th century, one in many thousands of people affected. And I'm telling you, they were looking. I've read all the textbooks. Uh, today, again, almost one in three, 29% affected uh, uh, since 1990. Okay, there's the increase, essentially. All right, now we're gonna hit 200 years of dietary history which was, is really a global human experiment, is the way I look, to, look at this, without informed consent, right? Because nobody chose this. Sugar, 1822 to 1999, sugar went up 17-fold. We know sugar is a nutrient-deficient diet, a, a nutrient-deficient food, right? Next, and the most important thing of all, cottonseed oil introduced right after the American Civil War, about 1866, 1867, is when we first began to consume this, and th this is where the human experiment really began, all right? And, we'll, and you'll see why. 1880, we get roller mill technology, which gives us refined white wheat flour. Now, wheat is 20% of the, of the world's diet. At least in the United States, 85% of that is refined, so it's nutrient deficient. 1911, Procter & Gamble gives us Crisco, trans fats, right? There we go, that's processed food, that's it. That's all of it right there. We had all the processed foods in place, essentially, by 1911 and then they just took off. So today in the United States, 600,000 foods available and the bulk of them are made right out of that. Now, 1939 and 1945, Weston Price con co uh, connected all of this together and, and, and made us all aware that Western diseases were driven by people consuming these foods, but nobody listened. And then if you look at this, the, the far right slide there from the, our own USDA, they recognized this, those four foods make up 63% of the American diet, right? They know that, they know this is the problem. So diseases of civilization, the, uh, the docs right there, look something like that. Okay, let's go back to 1918 for a minute. This is Elmer V. McCollum, nutrition researcher. This is the, a book he wrote, The Newer Knowledge of Nutrition, and this is extraordinary, it covers thousands of animal studies because they really wanted to know what was going on with diet. They wanted to understand what it was that was driving health. And uh, I'm gonna give you an example here. And there's extraordinary studies. This is just one of, one of many. All right, so they take diets. Now these rats, rats are usually weaned at about 25, 26 days. And then they put these two, these two sets of rats on identical diets except for one thing, the fat source. All right, so the rats on the left get 5% cottonseed oil. The rats on the right, one and a half percent butter fat. That's all the fat they got, one and a half percent. Here's what happens to them. The rats on the cottonseed oil um, grow to 60% of normal size and live 555 days on average. They're weak, fragile, sickly little rats. The rats on the butter fat, they are healthy, they grow to normal size, and they live 1,020 days. So they grow to almost twice the size, live twice as long, and are infinitely more healthy. Why? Anybody? Why? Fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K2, right? Those are not in any kind of vegetable oil, any kind of oil at all, in fact, uh, that comes from plants. You're gonna see this next. So McCollum says this in 1918, 1918, just look at the part I have underlined here. The diet must contain two as yet unidentified substances or groups of substances. One was fat soluble vitamins, the other water soluble. He says, one of these is associated with certain fats and is especially abundant in butter fat, egg yolk fats, and the fats of the glandular organs such as the liver and kidney. That's all the fantastically healthy foods, right? Right there. He says, but is not found in any fats or oils of vegetable origin. Even the healthy oils, coconut, palm, palm kernel, avocado oil, uh, uh, real true olive oil. They don't have vitamins A, D, and K2, right? They're not there. He continues, McCollum, 1918, he says, both the growth promoting fat, which is butter, and the trace of unidentified substance in the alcoholic extract of wheat germ, which was the B vitamins, are necessary for the promotion of growth or the preservation of health. We don't just need these vitamins to grow people, we need them in adulthood and old age in order to, to sustain us in good health. And this is what we continually overlook, especially when we focus on macronutrients, I believe. Okay, so 
<clears throat> let's get on the same page here because vegetable oils have a lot of names these days, right? But, the, but vegetable oils, seed oils, also known as polyunsaturated vegetable oils, PUFA or polyunsaturated fatty acids, edible oils, now the newest euphemism, plant oils, I think, you know, meant to just confuse us, um, omega-6 oils, and then linoleic acid. Now, linoleic acid, if you don't know, is the 18-carbon omega-6 fat that is sort of exemplary. It's the, it's the primary fatty acid of these uh, vegetable oils, all right? It accounts for about 80% of the, of the uh, fatty acids. All right. Now, here is the, um, here's the dreadful ones, all right? The high proof of oil, soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. There, I've said it. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. Um, these are the ones that are particularly dangerous. I'm sorry I don't have time, we have to move pretty quickly. All right, so this is our, from our, our paper uh, recently, and this is vegetable oil consumption in the United States um, for essentially all of history. Notice, 1866 to about 1909, we're like two grams a day. And then it just takes off as all we start getting soybean oil and all these other oils, right? And so by 2010, we're at 80 grams a day. Okay, so we went from zero in 1865 for all the world and for essentially all of history, pretty much, to 80 grams a day. Now, let me just say, this is an infinite increase in vegetable oil consumption. A lot of people talk about Tanya Blasbog's research where soybean oil went up a thousand-fold between 1909 to 1999, which indeed it did. But all this vegetable oil is an infinite increase. 80 grams a day, folks, is 720 calories worth. That's 32% of U.S. caloric intake. A third of our diet is coming out of factories that make these oils. I can't tell you how dangerous this is. So 1900, 99% of our fats came from animal fat, lard, butter, beef tallow, and suet, essentially. But by 2005, 86% of added fats came from vegetable oils. And notice, the vegetable oils are still going up, right? Now, take a look at this. Here's where the dietary guidelines were introduced, right? 1980. And remember, our fat consumption was going down and our carb consumption is going up. So guess what? Our animal fat consumption is still trending down and our vegetable oil consumption is still going up. Didn't just happen in the U.S. Here's developed countries, doubled in a period between 1963 and 2003. This is all around the world, developed countries doubled. Developing countries tripled. Japan, for example, four and a half fold. China almost an eight-fold increase. And this, this ended 17 years ago, this data. Where are we today? The Asians are getting as sick as we are, right? Okay, so here's the dietary fats, essentially, that, that are added to our diet, right? Uh, coconut oil, butter, palm, and lard. So the top four, see all the red? That's all the saturated fat. That's what's healthy. Now, from cottonseed oil down, all that blue, that's all these vegetable oils. And that, all that blue is the omega-6 linoleic acid, just that. That's what that is right there. If you transplant yourself back to 1865 and, and for uh, all of history and for all the world, essentially, this is where all the fats came from, butter, lard, and beef tallow at 3, 2, and 2% 2 omega-6 fat. So in other words, here's where we are today, all that blue, all that omega-6, Here's where we were in 1865. So what did this do to us? 1865, I calculated this. This is what our omega-6 consumption would have been in 1865 uh, with 40% animal fat from traditionally raised animals, 2.2 grams per day, less than 1% of our calories. Uh, uh, and then the, you can see this is increasing. By 1909, it's we're about 2% 2, 2 of our calories. Um, 1999, we're at 7% of calories and 18 grams a day. And 2008, 11.8% of our calories and 29 grams a day. We went from 2.2 grams to 29 grams a day. You're going to see why this is so important because we can't burn these for fuel properly. They're meant to be stored and used as signaling and structural molecules, particularly in the mitochondria, and, and they're not meant to be burned as fuel. So that's why we accumulate these. This, I want to make notice here, that's 2.2 grams is not yet published data. That will be in our next scientific paper. But 
This is a 12-fold increase in omega-6 in about 145 years, 12-fold. Okay, what did it do to us? Here's heart disease. And this is our published data as well. Look at the vegetable oil in black versus the heart disease deaths in red, right? Everybody see a remarkable correlation? How about saturated fat in the purple versus heart disease? Anybody see any correlation there at all? Heart, saturated fat practically flat for the whole last century, changed five grams, right? In fact, I would submit, if you see a correlation between saturated fat here and heart disease, you would also believe that Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito are indeed twins. Okay, so there's a bunch of populations around the world that we know don't have heart disease, right? And I'm not even gonna name all these, but they all have very similar things in common. So let's talk about uh, three of them very quickly. The Maasai tribe of Kenya and Tanzania. Now, the, just so you know, this is where Kenya and Tanzania uh, are in Eastern Africa. And I'm just gonna say, this is what that, this is what all these Maasai warriors, all the Maasai look like this. Lean, healthy, chiseled, fan, fantastically healthy people, right? Well, anyway, George Mann and colleagues in 1970, uh, uh, around 1970, 1972, extensively studied them. Now, what do the Maasai eat? Milk, meat, and blood from the cattle they herd, they're pastoralists. They dr the typical warrior drinks three to five quarts of raw, whole milk per day, and their milk has a lot of saturated fat. Um, okay, 3,000 calories a day. These guys only weigh about 128 pounds on average a piece. Their diet is 66% animal fat, 33 to 45% of that is saturated animal fat. It's about 17% carb, 1.7% omega-6 fat. Now that's the number I want you to pay attention to this whole time if you would. All right, well, what did George Mann find? They did 50 autopsies and they did, I think it was 350 EKGs no heart disease, no heart attacks, except one possible silent MI in the entire group. Yet, our American Heart Association says no more than five to six percent saturated fat, right? So how do these guys get away with consuming up to 45 percent saturated fat? Well, American Heart Association would just say it's another paradox, right? Conventional medicine would say this, fools, don't you know animal fat would kill you, right? They would say this, you must eat more healthy polyunsaturated oils like Americans. So this is an animal fat diet. This is polyunsaturated fat diet. Animal fat, polyunsaturated fat. How many times should I do this? Okay, let's move down to Tokelau in the South Pacific, kind of midway between Hawaii and Australia. Three little islands down there, atolls. The, the, the Tokelauans were studied um, 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Very interesting, because here's their diet. Coconut, fish, starchy tubers, and fruit. That's it, it's very simple. 54 to 62% of their calories come from coconut. Coconut oil, 91 to 94.5% saturated. Their diet was 53% fat, high fat diet, 48% saturated. So while the Maasai hold the honors for the most saturated animal fat in the world at a, up to 45%, the Tokelauans have the most saturated tropical oil fat in the world at 48%. Guess what? 2% of their diet is PUFA. Now that's total PUFA. That's omega-6 and omega-3 together. Well, um, so where are they getting their PUFA? From fish and coconut. That means that about half of that was omega-3, so their poof, omega-6 poof is about 1%. Again, that's the number I want you to pay attention to, if you would. 1982, they studied men, 40 to 69 years of age, no heart attacks, uh, virtually, no obesity, no diabetes in this population. They are fantastically healthy, okay. Now, this will look like a diversion, but it's not. This is the omega-6 linoleic acid in our adipose tissue in Americans, 1959 to 2008. Stephen Guinea collated 37 studies where they had biopsied the fat of Americans. Now look where our omega-6 linoleic acid was on average in 1959, 9.1%. Okay, this is in our fat. And do you know what our obesity was in 1959, 1960? 13%, okay? In 2008, our uh, linoleic acid in our fat, 21.5%. And you remember I showed you that in, in 2008, our omega-6 in our diet was 11.8%. In other words, it approximately doubles 
in your fat, because we accumulate these, and they accumulate in your cells and in your mitochondria, and this is where they wreak havoc because it's polyunsaturated, and they're the ones that oxidize. All right, so 2008, you know what our obesity was? 34%. Now, the next thing I'm gonna show you, I searched for for three years to find this. You know what I wanted to know? What was the omega-6 fat in anybody's adipose who was on an ancestral diet? Anybody in the world. I finally found it. Tocolalins, right here. 3.8%. It is off the chart low. Remember I said their omega-6 in their diet was roughly 1%? 3.8% people. This is where we should be. And this is what keeps you healthy, right here. Okay. One more population, Tukacinta, Papua New Guinea. The, 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 the Papua New Guineans in this study were, were evaluated extensively, 1966 to 68. Sweet potatoes account for more than 90% of their calories. They live off of over a thousand different kinds of sweet potatoes. This is one of their harvests. They occasionally feast on pork and chicken. They are pork herders, but would rarely eat their pork. Um, so here's their diet, 1966 to 68, 94.6% .6 carb, 3% protein, 2.4% fat. Omega-6, there's that number again, 0.6%. Now, what they find about them? Here's what they say in the studies. Population was lean, physically fit, and in good nutritional state. Absence of obesity and hypertension. No diabetes or gout was found. Ischemic heart, heart disease was rare, if not absent. And no macular degeneration. 340 people over age 40, none. Now, absence of obesity. If we think that carbs drive insulin and insulin drives fat, how do we explain this? Okay, I'm just gonna move on. Now, here, what do these healthy populations not have? No sugar, no refined wheat, no processed foods, and no vegetable oils, of course, right? All right, so let's talk about their macronutrient rate, uh, ratios. Did the carb percent matter in these populations? Assuming you're consuming an ancestral diet, did it matter? No, it was 17% in the Maasai, about 95% in Tukacinta. How about the fat percent? Did it matter? Also, no. About 2.4% total fat in Tukacinta, 66% animal fat in Maasai. How about the fat composition? Did saturated fat seem to matter in any of this? Doesn't matter. About 1% Tukacinta, 45% in the Maasai, 48% in Tokelau. How about monounsaturated fat? Also doesn't matter. About 1% in Tukacinta, 53 to 65% in the Maasai all of them fantastically lean, healthy, and without heart disease. Now the big question, what about the omega-6 PUFA, right? This is the elephant in the room. I know people talk about this, but what should it be? 0.6 to 1.7%. I couldn't make the font any bigger than that, I tried. It's big, 93 or whatever, as big as it'll go. Okay, now, Compare this to westernized uh, uh, populations. Uh, the omega-6, 7 to 12% today in our diets. Remember, we were at 7% in 1999. Now we're at 12, or we were 12% by 2008, 11.8%. Now, I don't know where we are. I mean, we're higher than that. Okay, so let me explain what I think is going on here. Remember I said this is, the problem is pro-oxidative and then toxic, right? Here's the pro-oxidative part. So when you consume omega-6 to excess, which is gonna be a westernized diet, it'll have nutrient deficiencies, but what matters is, is it combines with reactive oxygen species like hydroxyl radicals, which we produce one times 20 to the 10th per day um, in, in every person. Okay, so this begins a catastrophic lipid peroxidation cascade. These polyunsaturated fats accumulate in your cells, accumulate in your membranes, accumulate in your mitochondria, and they cause a peroxidation reaction. All right, now, I won't be able to go, go through all the biochemistry here, but if you want to watch my Ancestral Health Symposium uh, lecture, uh, presentation uh, from 2019, last year, um, I go through this biochemistry. But this devastates uh, uh, cardiolipin. 
and this leads to electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation failure. Electron transport chain is where we create 90% of our, our energy. So when this happens, we have mitochondrial dysfunction. So we lose energy production. And this is why every single one of these disorders, you know, from heart disease to atherosclerosis to type 2 diabetes to macular degeneration and cancer all have the same thing. They all have mitochondrial dysfunction. This is why. Now, the very first thing that happens when the electron transport chain fails in this scenario is that it starts shooting out reactive oxygen species. These are hydroxyl radicals and superoxide, and this took me years to understand, to try to understand this. And uh, so that creates a, a, a catastrophic lipid, pro or feeds back to the lipid peroxidation. Then the next thing that happens is insulin resistance at the cellular level, because this is what's happening. The cell, there's so much reactive oxygen species that, and the electron transport chain is failing and the cell gets sick and it puts up its stop signs and it says, look, I don't want glucose, I don't want fatty acids, I don't want anything, I'm sick in bed. I can't do this, I can't work, right? So now I'm insulin resistant. And uh, so, you know, that ends up leading to metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and so forth. But what I will submit to you is it's not that we're consuming carbs and you start filling up the, the cell and all that. I will submit to you, even if we can't measure it, the very first thing that's happening in this scenario is the insulin resistance comes first. Then, the, then you start uh, uh, developing lipid uh, uh, droplets and so forth in your, in your cells, in your, in your uh, liver, and so forth. Uh, okay, what's next? Reduce fatty acid beta oxidation because the electron transport chain is not working well. So now you're not burning fat for fuel properly. So the person gaining weight and getting sick in this regard is now carb dependent. Their glycolysis is working, but their, their Krebs cycle and electron transport chain aren't working to burn fat for fuel properly. All right, so now they start storing the fat, right? So this leads to obesity. Now, Loss of energy leads directly to nuclear and mitochondrial DNA mutations. And what do we get out of that? Cancers. Next, heart failure. You're gonna see this in just a minute. In just a few minutes, I'll go through this. Mitochondrial dysfunction leads directly to heart failure and directly because of high omega-6, and it'll do it in three weeks in rats. Okay, next, apoptosis, necrosis, cell death, and this leads to diseases like macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Up on your upper left, um, this catastrophic lipid peroxidation cascade leads to toxic aldehydes. And I'm going to hit this right away next, and you're going to see this. Okay, so here, here's what happens. Most of this linoleic acid, when it peroxidizes, it develops lipid hydroperoxides. And then these rapidly degenerate into <clears throat> all of these things, 4-hydroxynonanol, malondialdehyde, Oxidized linoleic acid metabolites with like 9 and 13 hode, acrolein, carboxyethylpyrrole. Here's what these do collectively cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, atherogenic, thrombogenic, and obesogenic. And just in case you're not aware, atherogenic means inducing atherosclerosis, and thrombogenic means inducing clots. You know, that, that right there can cause, this can be a cause for strokes. Okay. So that leads to all the diseases of civilization. So we're gonna look at th uh, three studies, I believe it is. This is a study with isocaloric diets, okay? All the same uh, calories. Three groups of rats for three weeks, identical amounts of calories, protein, fat, and carbs, and omega-3 fats. Only one single variable in this study, and this is a very well-designed de study, uh, I, I believe. Omega-6, only variable. Three groups, beef, tallow, olive oil, and safflower oil group. And you can see the omega-6 going from 4.4 to 7.7 .7 to the safflower oil group is the really high 36.6% omega-6. All right, here you can see, you can see the beef, olive, and safflower, all the calories the same. It's a high fat diet at 59%. Here's the omega-6, I circled the, the interesting part, you know, 4.4% in the beef fat group. Uh, versus 36.6% in the safflower oil group. Look how high their body fat went in the safflower oil group in three weeks to 54.5%. So what is this, 
Now, now make a point of this. This 4.4% is too high, and I'll show you why, because they added it, linseed oil is, is what they really did. But here's, the, here's what happened to these, these rats in three weeks. Now, they all gained weight, but relative to the beef fat group, the olive oil group gained 9.6% more weight, which is 14.8 pounds human equivalent. The safflower oil, oil group gained 15.6% or 24 pounds human equivalent more, right? How's this possible? They're on the same calories. They're all consuming the same calories, right? Okay, now I had a problem with this because why did the beef fat gain weight? Here's why. Now, <clears throat> if you look on the far left of this, um, that group wasn't included, which would have been beef fat only, the one without linseed oil. They put linseed oil in here to try to give them omega-3. Well, they didn't need to do that with beef fat. It already has it. So we don't know. That, that group would have been 1.4% linoleic acid, but we don't know what that would have happened there. The group that's next in the blue, the beef fat plus the linseed oil, that's 4.4% omega-6, and look how much weight they gained, 27.6% more than where they were initially. The olive oil group was 7.7% omega-6, and they gained 37.2% more than th what they weighed initially. And then look at the omega, the, uh, the safflower oil group um, gained 43.2% more than their initial weight. That is, the, that is 66 and a half pounds human equivalent for a man in three weeks. And the only difference is the omega-6. They all consume the same calories. Okay, here's a study about heart failure. It's very simple, very simple. Just two groups, a high PUFA group that got normal lab chow with 20% sunflower oil. That's less, that's less omega-6 than what Americans are consuming today on average. Then there's a low PUFA group that got normal lab chow. Four weeks, this study. Look what happens. In four weeks, the group that got the sunflower oil, they have 32% reduction in their cardiac output at high afterloads, which means they're at, at systolic blood pressure, which is like 138. In four weeks of feeding, these rats have heart failure. Okay, one more. Here's an isochloric 40% fat diet, um, chow versus 4% soy oil versus 19% soy oil. Okay, this was a 32-week study, basically seven and a half months. Now they had on the far left, you can see that was the chow, the standard chow, which is 1.2% in the red at the bottom is the linoleic acid, the omega-6 linoleic acid, 1.2%. The next group is um, the 4% soy oil, which is 2.2% linoleic acid. And the third group is 19% soy oil, and that's omega-6, 10% linoleic acid, okay? 0% sugar, what they used good carbs in here, they used maltodextrin and starch. So no sugar, good clean di uh, study. Um, and so here's, here's what, you can see the weight that they gained, all right, but uh, let me just get to the point. The mice on the 19% soybean oil weighed 55% more than mice on chow. Okay, this was in 32 weeks. Now, let me give you the, um, human equivalent. This is the human equivalent of a 190 pound man, which I just used my weight, versus, uh, the, uh, I mean the, for the chow part, versus the 19% soy oil, 10% linoleic acid, which is less than Americans are consuming today. That would have been the equivalent of a 294 pound man in seven and a half months of eating this way. They're eating the same calories, the, the 4% and the 19% soy oil, the exact same calories. Okay, now this is the same study. I didn't include all the categories because it's so confusing to, to do quickly. But here's the glucose tolerance test that shows that the soybean oil diet rapidly induces diabetes. That's the top one there. Um, you can see that, that uh, after an uh, intraperitoneal glucose, challenge, look at their glycemia, they're diabetic. And then the next one down is soybean oil plus 25% fructose, they're also diabetic. But the green line is um, also 40% fat, which was made up of 36% coconut oil and 4% soybean oil and 25% fructose, that did not cause diabetes. 
And then here is the, an insulin tolerance test. And you can see the very top one is the 19% soybean oil diet, which induced marked insulin resistance, even worse than the 19% the soybean oil plus 25% fructose. Incredibly, the 25% fructose was protective in some way. I don't know how that works, but it was. But the, and then they did a 25% high, high fat uh, diet, again, 40% fat and 25% fructose did not induce diabetes or insulin resistance. Okay, how about their liver? You can see the standard chow uh, in the upper left, um, healthy liver, <clears throat> and then in B, upper right, that's 36% coconut oil plus just 4% soybean oil, they're getting liver, fatty liver disease. Then go to the one below that in uh, F, right lower, 19% soybean oil for 16 weeks, fatty liver disease. And then on your uh, lower left, soybean oil for 32 weeks, now they've got fatty liver and hepatic balloon injury. This is really sick liver disease. Okay, what about vegetable oil and cancer? The 19% soybean oil diet, which 10% LA, less than Americans are con consuming now, in 32 weeks caused 31 cancer-associated genes to be dysregulated, five cancer-promoting genes upregulated, six cancer-inhibiting genes suppressed. Um, and here's the, here's the finale here, 32 weeks, on a 19% soybean oil, 10% linoleic acid diet, did this. Obesity, visceral obesity, insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, diabetes, frank diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with balloon injury, 31 cancer genes dysregulated, and incredibly, the 19% soybean oil diet was worse than 19% soybean oil and 25% fructose. This is what I want to say. Really? These oils are the, these, these fats are the same? Are you kidding me? I mean, the, the fats coming out of these vegetables, this, this is a real vegetable oil refinery. This is what the, I can't tell them apart from petroleum oil refineries. You know, they look the same. Um, this is what I would say. This is toxic waste coming out of vegetable oil refineries. This is extraordinarily dangerous to us. And the other one is, you know, the, the animal fat's divinely healthy. So I would submit to you that uh, this is how I would propose the contribution of processed foods to obesity and, and chronic disease. I would submit to you 80% of it is driven by vegetable oils and trans fats, and they, are, they run together because the trans fats are in the oils. Sugar, I would say, is about 15%, and uh, refined wheat, the other, the other five. All right. So how can we consume only about 1% omega-6 polyunsaturated fat? And you already know the answer, right? No seed oils, none, no vegetable oils, none of these kind of oils, no processed foods because they're, they're in all the processed foods and you know, no fast foods. Restaurants almost all cook in soybean oil and canola oil and they are disastrous. So, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first I just want to say it's been an honor and a pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, and uh, I, I want to say I hope that I've been able to plant a seed that will take root and you'll begin to consider this and evaluate this further for yourself. I want to end by painting a picture of a nutritional dichotomy that I'd like for you to consider. And this is entirely based in science. And, um, and, and for the moment, consider diets where, that are unsupplemented with vitamins, all right? So if you consume 100% of your fats from traditionally raised animals, whether they be on land, at sea, or from fresh water, and you consume no processed foods, you are likely to be extremely lean, healthy, and live a long and healthy, good life. You're gonna probably look like a Maasai warrior. And if you're not that way now, eat like that, and you'll start getting that direction. You'll move that direction. On the other hand, if you consume 100% of your fats from the polyunsaturated vegetable oils, you will rapidly become ill, severely metabolically deranged, stunted growth in childhood, almost certainly overweight and, ob and or obese in adulthood, and your life 
will be cut extremely short. You'll meet your end extremely prematurely. And it won't matter if you're one month old or 90 years old. This is a scientifically proven mathematical certainty. And it has been known for over a hundred years. So I ask you, which fats do you think are healthy? Thank you.